meeting of uh, Tuesday, May 2nd, 4 o'clock. Can I have a motion on the minutes? If I adopt, move second. All those in favor, contrary, carry it. We have a meeting on May the 16th in these uh, very chambers. And the first application that we have in planning development is the application by Bradley Dorr for rezoning at 9671 number one road from a single detached to RS1A zone to a compact single detached RC2 zone. And uh, Suzanne, Alex, and uh, Wayne's in the background. So I guess, uh, Alex, you got the job to give us a rundown on it. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so I'll, I will be providing a brief summary of the application. The proposed rezoning has been requested to facilitate the subdivision of one single detached lot into two compact single detached lots with, re with vehicle access from the rear lane. This is compliant with the arterial road policy. There is an, uh, there is an existing unoccupied single family home on the property. This home does not contain a secondary suite. Both new lots will be providing minimum one bedroom, 48.8 square meter secondary suites. As a part of the application, there was an extensive review of tree preservation opportunities. Three healthy western red cedar trees on site along the number one road frontage will be retained. Retention of these trees will require special measures during construction to ensure the existing grade around the trees is retained. An arborist contract and a $30,000 tree survival security is required as a condition of rezoning in order to support the retention of these trees. Submission of a landscape plan with minimum three new trees and associated security is, is required prior to final rezoning in order to ensure the outdoor space is enhanced and maintained. And I am happy to answer any questions from committee. Okay, do we have any questions? All right, seeing yes, none? Oh, okay, I didn't see your hand. Yeah, okay, uh, I've got Laura first. Okay, here we are. Thank you. I'm not on the committee, but I'll just ask a couple questions. Um, so regarding, this is just in my neighborhood, so I know it, and I know these trees well. And um, the three cedar trees that are being retained, are those the ones in the middle of the property? So through the chair to Councillor Galanders, um, the three trees uh, are, that are being retained are actually on the outside, close to the exterior property, property lines of the existing property. Yep, so there's trees all along the front of the property. So are they the ones in the middle? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Galanders, no, they are not. So the ones in the middle are being removed? Through the chair to Councillor Galanders, yes. The, the trees in the center of the property um, and uh, I mean, I don't have the tags di directly in front of me, but yeah, the ones in the center of the property are, are to be removed. Um, and then there is one on the, on the eastern property. I think it's the eastern, there's one on the eastern, and then two on the western, or sorry, northern and southern um, property lines. It's on our PLN 31. Yeah. If you want to see them there. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. so was the... <clears throat> reason for the ones in the mid the two large ones in the middle not being retained for they were look very healthy those ones was it just the, those ones that are in the way of the utilities yeah so um to the chair to council glanders there's actually five trees in the center of the property um so they were tagged for removal um due to the poor condition um, so they've previously been topped or exhibit structural de defects such as cavities at the main branch union or co-dominant stems with inclusions um, so these trees also conflict with the utility corridor. Those ones too. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, Carol. Thank you very much to the chair. Um, I was going to ask pretty much the same question because this will have lane access. So there's no, not going to be a driveway off of number one road. And even though the trees have been topped, I mean, can't they still be saved? Because if they ever did have to come down, it'd be easy peasy to do because you have access from number one road. Yeah, so uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, um, there's uh, still utility uh, works that need to be um, conducted in order to connect to the uh, water. They uh, need to provide new water services as well as a new um, storm sewer connection that goes through the, where those trees are. Um, so we did look at the possibility of retaining them, um, but due to, due to that conflict and their, their, uh, their essentially their, their poor condition, um, it was determined uh, that they were uh, 
should be removed. Okay, and um, where will the outside area be for the two suites? Um, so, uh, through the chair, sorry, to Councillor Day, there is no specified outdoor area for secondary suites on compact single family lots. Um, there is a small yard in the rear of each single, or in the rear yard of each single family home, um, but we don't have a say on whether or not that space would be accessible to the secondary suite. Uh, okay, user. so one last question through the chair. Um, there's a lane, and directly behind is um, another dwelling. So there won't be any sun decks bearing down on the people behind. So through the chair to Councillor Day, um, at this time there's no detailed uh, plans for construction um, for the home, so uh, we don't know what the inevitable design will be. But, um, but yeah, that's all I can say on that at this time. Yeah, I think in, whenever there's a lane and people have been living on the other side of the lane for often decades, they shouldn't have to deal with a sun deck looking down on them. Uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor Day, uh, we don't have the same kind of design control over single family as we do with duplex and others, um, but I understand your point. We have that control over coach houses, but not single family homes. Right. Not, not in a, a compact lot uh, subdivision okay. like this. Maybe we should change that. <laughs> okay, thank you very right. much. Um, Wayne, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, just in response to the deck, I would also point out that these uh, single family homes do have detached garages that will be fronting the lane, so there is significant separation between the principal dwelling and, and the lane, mm -hmm. as, as there will be a detached garage, not a coach house, but a detached garage. Okay. Okay. You're that good. Should be good. Thank you. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Move seconded. All those in favor? Contrary carried. Thank you. That will go to public hearing next month. Thank you very much, both of you. And the next is an application by Fauché Architecture for rezoning at uh, 7371 Number Four Road from single density detached R1 RS1F zone to the medium density townhouses RTM T2 zone, and the rec recommendations from staff on it. Josh and uh, Cynthia, Cynthia, Sim, you're on. Through the chair, um, <coughs> I have nothing to add to the report, but I would like to highlight a few points, if that's okay. Uh, so this rezoning application is to enable the development of 19 townhouse units with vehicle access to General Curry Road. Uh, items worth noting are the provision of four convertible units, two secondary suites, and the retention of 12 trees on site, as well as two neighboring trees and three city street trees. Uh, the application secures uh, future shared access to the residual property to the north through a right of way uh, that is to be registered on title of the subject site prior to rezoning. <coughs> Based on the preliminary concept plans uh, provided in the package, one variance request is proposed to allow building projections less than five meters high into the exterior side yard along General Curry Road. And lastly, a servicing agreement uh, is required for service connection design and construction, as well as for frontage improvements and installation of a special crosswalk from the southwest corner of General Curry to the east side of Number 4 Road. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, I'm going to go to Alexa, uh, who's on video. Alexa. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we possibly be provided with a copy of what an, a standard right-of-way on title looks like? Can we get a copy of what that looks like so when someone buys their, pro their townhouse, what that looks like, um, so that we have a clear understanding of what people are signing off on or not signing off of, so that in seven years when the property to the north redevelops and these people all tell us that they never heard of this, that we have a better understanding of what we're looking at and what we're hearing. Can that Is be that possible? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Liu, um, we do have um, precedent uh, documents of this kind um, with a plan that we could show you. Um, the specific right-of-way document that goes along with this application won't be prepared until um, should this application be um, granted third reading by Council at a public hearing. No, no, clearly we wouldn't be able to get one for this one yet, but there'd be some out there that we could look at maybe in a memo or something we could get a couple uh, an idea of what what people are signing off on what it looks like um you know if we need to do something different from our end of it or something to make it more clear so we don't sort of go through this every time the property to the, the adjoining property decides it's ready to to redevelop but thank you otherwise i think this looks pretty interesting um there's it's mostly 
side-by-side -side parking, couple tandem spots, and minimal number of, of, of um, homes fronting four roads, so that it's a quieter community, and, and I think, I think this will do a lot for the neighborhood. Thank you. Could we get that maybe be before public hearing? Is uh, that too much of a task? Just quickly. No, we can we can provide a, a precedent Is document. Could you? Um, okay, just take memo. it under advisement. Yeah. Okay. All right, Carol. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, following up on Councillor Liu's comments, um, you've been here when we've had so many people come to us and say we didn't know that they were going to use our driveway for a whole other development, and this happened um, on um, St. Albans Road, and it also happened at Two and Blundell. Same story, both times. When people purchased their properties, they had no clue. And they used different lawyers, different real estate agents, different uh, notaries. They all had the same result. They just simply didn't know. So I want to make sure that, given this is the exact same situation, that we make it very, very clear that the, that the right-of-way must be registered on each individual townhouse, not just on the condo strata property. Is that possible? Through the chair to Councillor Day, as uh, Ms. Lucier had uh, acknowledged earlier, we can provide Council with some information regarding the process of the registration of those documents to confirm that it is registered on the Strata Common property as well as the title. Um, what I could also add is, uh, as I mentioned before, some of the more pertinent design measures that we do take and implement through the DP are uh, done in order to give owners better awareness of the fact that once they do move in that their driveway would be extended. This is done through signage on site and the design of the drive aisle to make it clear that the drive aisle would continue on to the north. And so when all this is happening, people don't own them yet. So how do the people who end up buying them get this information? Through the chair to Councillor Day. Again, that's through the, the notaries and we rely on the real estate and conveying professionals to convey that information to But that's on land titles, isn't it? Already. It's already, it's already there. Already. They just, it's the same old story. The real estate no. agent just wants to sell I, I have it. a few other questions. Okay, I just, just to, on that, let's get Wayne's comment, please. Yeah. And then back Thank to you. you. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day. It, it is important to note that these documents are registered as a condition of rezoning. So they are registered on title before the Strata Corporation is created. The Strata Corporation is created near the end of construction. Uh, we do rely on the land title office to then subsequently ensure that the document is registered on individual strata lots and the common property when the strata is formed. Mm -hmm. So in terms of legal title, and documents registered, we register them on the existing property. When the strata is formed, those documents are all to be transferred to the individual titles as part of the registration of the strata corporation. And yet it doesn't happen. Um, so uh, do we need a policy right. that we direct um, the land title office to ensure that the right of way is, is registered on each individual townhouse? That is uh, a through the chair to Councillor Dave, according to practice, that is what should happen. I'm simply uh, advising that uh, we do rely on the examiners at the land titles to do this, because it does happen after rezoning is adopted, after development permit is issued, and the registration of the strata plan is done without city's input or approval. I think that's, thank you, I think through the chair, I think that's where we're running into trouble. I wonder if we shouldn't, when we're finished with this, make a motion that we write a letter to the land title office asking for clarification and ensuring that this is not going to happen again in the future. Well, uh, maybe we, well, can, we can write a letter, but they're only going to do what they're going to do. Well, we got to find they're something. they're not necessarily going to do our the okay, job well, for the problem. But I have a think couple. about it. I'm back to you now. Yeah, sorry. You still have the floor. Yeah, thank you. I just have a couple more questions, and then... Maybe I'll talk to staff about this afterwards. Yep. Um, I'm really happy that there's going to be two suites. I'm really happy that out of the 38 parking spots, only four are tandem. I think that is the way to go. And um, I'm happy that um, the accesses will not be on number two row, that they'll be on, um, on uh, what is it, um, the other one, um, the side road. Um, what about the tenant who's, re who's renting? What will the uh, developer be doing to help relocate the tenant? 
Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, my understanding is that um, the applicant uh, knows the tenant quite well and, and the applicant is here um, if you would like to hear more information from him. Um, my understanding is that the tenant does have alternate um, uh, home to, to live in, uh, but that he's currently renting that out to his farm workers on his own property, um, and, but that he's fully aware of the rezoning application and that um, you know his uh, residence there was only for a certain amount of time. Um, but the applicant has indicated that he will work with um, the tenant to to find um, alternate uh, alternate housing should he need it afterwards. Yeah, I, I think that's a responsible thing to do. Last question on page PLN sixty three. The um, west side elevation shows a sun deck, and my concern is that the property right next door may end up having. A neighbor who has a bird's eye view because when I look at the, the map, the overall map, I'm worried that the house on the west side will have a sun deck bearing down on them. Am I right or wrong about that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, uh, you said PLN 63, is that uh, correct? So PLN 63, and okay. it says west side elevation, and there's two sun decks. Okay, so, so that would be right next door to the house on the west side, right? Uh, so this building faces number four road, so there's uh, decks proposed uh, fronting number four road and then decks proposed um, like not facing the, um, the neighbor but uh, to the west, facing west. So th that picture then is an error where it says west elevation? Uh, no, it's just that that's facing um, west, so the, uh, if I can find an alternative West. plan that shows the, uh, I think it's on the aerial view. If you go to PLN 60, uh, that's the site plan. Um, it, the two decks are facing west of um, building two. Is that your understanding? Oh, so it's the, it's the building closer to number four, or not correct. the one closer to, so it's still the west side, but it's not the one facing the neighbor. Correct. That's correct. Excellent. Thank you. That's what okay. I need to know. That's it. All right, Laura. Thank you to the chair. Um, just a question. I Yeah, this looks good, and I appreciate uh, the building envelope modifications to work around some of the trees. Um, there are a lot of trees that do have to be removed. Um, on PLN 48, I'm just going to draw attention to this one um, sentence here mm -hmm. uh, where it says six trees on site, although in good condition, are recommended for removal due to the following reasons. There's five in conflict with the proposed vehicle access and drive aisle, um, which can't be relocated. And then it says one tree, tree number 723, is in conflict with the building envelope, which if retained would potentially result in the loss of one townhouse unit. And I understand that when developers are building to the maximum allowable density, um, that that would cost you know, um, significant money, might not make the project financially viable. I'm wondering, is there any mechanism in place that we currently have, or is there any referral that we currently have in place um, where to retain a significant tree, I'm not sure that tree number 723 is significant, but I know that there are a couple of significant ones that are being removed, um, where if a developer were to retain a significant tree, they could get a bonus density, like perhaps go up four stories there and do a few stacked condos instead of a townhouse unit, and it could have the tree as you know a feature in the middle of the development to make it financially viable to keep the tree. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Gillanders. Um, in terms of this rezoning, uh, there is a sub-area plan that sets the, um, that provides guidance on the, uh, the type of density that we would consider. Um, this proposal is within that range. Um, should that tree have been identified as one um, worth, you know, retaining, if it was, uh, for example, a significant tree, it's not. Um, uh, then that is something that you know we could consider for this application, but it's I guess not always the case for others. Mm -hmm. And so not for this application per se, even, but just going forward, would that be something I we'd need to make a referral on? Because I could do a notice of motion for next week that staff review, um, have, refer and look into um, options for bonus densities in areas 
for townhouse developments for retention of significant trees. So that there could be an easy peasy, we're going to keep this tree and we could do four stories there. I'm going to get Wayne to make a comment on that if I can. Thank you. Okay. To, uh, uh, thank Wayne. you through the chair to Councillor Glanders. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, the suggestion is that the form of housing would change as a result of retention of a significant tree. Uh, that being the case, there is no policy basis right now for staff to, for example, consider an apartment form instead of a townhouse form uh, as a reason to retain a tree. Uh, with respect to the uh, reference to additional density, uh, I would caution that as you put more on a site, there is generally less land available to retain trees as you accommodate parking and the such. So. It, it is a bit um, difficult to suggest that uh, additional density be considered as a result. Uh, what we as staff typically do, and we do have existing policies that would allow us to do this, is to look at alternatives to minimum setback requirements. Yes. So we will, in certain instances, look to reduce setbacks in exchange for tree retention. Uh, but I do believe that there would be an inherent conflict between additional density, changing form of development as a reason to, or an incentive to retain a tree. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right, Carol, back to you. The chair, and I do apologize, I missed one question. On uh, page PLN 43, the very last paragraph is called Market Rental Housing Policy. And it states that this application is exempt from the market rental housing policy if the rezoning bylaw is granted prior to reading, first reading June 20th, 2023. So what, going forward, what would this development have had for um, market rental had we, it been after June 20th? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, um, should first reading not be granted by uh, June twentieth, there is um, a I believe it's two dollars and ninety five cents per square foot of total building area um, contribution that would be required to be provided. So no additional units, just additional money. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Seeing no further questions, uh, a motion to. Uh, Give first reading, move, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, the next item is the application, again, by 4G Architect uh, for rezoning at 10611 and 10751 River Drive from industrial storage IS zone to the low uh, to mid-rise uh, apartment, which is ZLR 46 in the Bridgeport zone. And the recommendation is to grant first reading and we've got Sarah and uh, uh, Josh again. Okay, Sarah, are you doing this one? Thank You're you, on. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, staff have no additional comments to provide. The staff report before you today is in support of a rezoning application in the Tate neighborhood. Brief highlights of the project include redevelopment of an industrial property with a residential development featuring two six-story apartment buildings along the north edge of the site facing the north arm of the Fraser River, a four-story rental building anchored at the corner of River Drive and Shell Road at the southeast corner of the site, and a single-level amenity building. The buildings are located over a single-level parking structure, and together the buildings would contain approximately 181 residential apartments, including 18 lemur units, 13 market rental units, and 150 strata units. The proposed development is consistent with market rental policies in the OCP as it relates to in-stream applications. The rental units will be secured in perpetuity through rental tenure zoning, as well as registering on title a market rental agreement and a housing agreement. The developer is providing to the city a 7.3 meter wide uh, area of land along the north edge of the site for diking purposes. A servicing agreement will be required prior to rezoning adoption for the design and construction of roadworks, diking improvements, and utility upgrades. There is a parking reduction associated with the development, and transportation demand management measures are to be provided, including a transit pass program, additional residential bike parking, electric plug-ins for electric bikes, and bicycle maintenance facilities. The developer will be installing public art on site through the city's public art program process. 
and the proposed development is designed to meet energy step code requirements. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carol. Thank you very much to the chair. Great report. Um, exciting project. Um, it, it's it's um, surprising anybody wants to live underneath the flight path, but I guess we're out of room everywhere, so it's yeah. better than you know not owning right or not renting. Um, and I know this site well. It's the old ambulance site. You know, I've worked there on ambulances, so. Um, my question is, on uh, page 87, Park Riviera was responsible for the dike upgrades along that stretch, but it hasn't been done, and if it doesn't get done, then this developer will have to do it. How is that going to work? Um, through the through the chair to councillor day, um, there is uh, an existing servicing agreement in place. Um, if those works uh, are not completed by the time that this application is ready to move forward, the developer will be required to enter into a servicing agreement for those frontage dike improvement works that are required. Okay, um, kind of doesn't seem fair to the new guy, you know. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if the previous developer was supposed to, and let's face it, that's a huge development, if they were supposed to do it and it doesn't get done, it doesn't seem right that, that the buck gets passed to the new guy. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, uh, my understanding is that the um, developer from Park Riviera is, is busy working on that servicing agreement and it may very well be the case that um, that, that resolves itself before this project moves forward. Okay. Could um, I just jump in there and follow that? Sure, sure. Will it be done to our Richmond standards? Um, you know, our standards are pretty darn high right now with what we're doing with our DAKING program. That's why I wondered um, However, will it be done yeah, Mr. to Richmond Chair, standards? There, there is an existing servicing agreement in effect that does require work to be um, completed to city standards. Yeah, all right, good. Okay, Carol, carry on. Sorry. Oh, no, that's good that we're all working together here. That's awesome. Um, okay, on page um, 91, we talk about amenity space indoor, 100 uh, square meters, but they're actually going to build 144 square meters. Um, what are we going to use that space for? Have we got any plans for it at this point? Um, through the chair to councillor day, programming will be reviewed um, at the DP stage. At this point, it, it looks quite flexible. It okay. is a standalone building. Will the city own that space or will the developer own that space? Um, through the chair to councillor day, that will be owned by the uh, strata. By the strata. Not a, it's not a city facility. It's the residence by the strata indoor amenity space. So. Before we get to that stage, can the city assess what we do need and then require that the, that, 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 that let's say, say for argument's sake, we decided a daycare should be in there. Um, can we insist that that's what goes in that daycare, daycare or amenity space? Um, through the chair to uh, Councillor Day, um, there, there is actually a city-owned uh, child care yeah. space in the block just a, a little bit further to the west. Um, just using that as an example, like, oh, can maybe we decide we need a, I don't know, auxiliary police station or something. I don't know what we need in that area, but if we do come up with something, can we insist that that's what goes into that amenity space? Uh, through the chair to councillor day, in this case, um, uh, I believe what you're referring to is kind of our typical approach taken on uh, other projects elsewhere in the city where we are taking the facility as a, as a city amenity. In this case, it is being provided as a private on-site amenity for the residents of this community. Uh, that work is being undertaken by the developer of the project. Okay. All the programming is up to them. The uh, Bridgeport area plan does not provide for what uh, specific indoor amenities shall be provided for private citizens or private residents. So they could decide to make it into a gym or whatever. Okay, and my last question is, um, there's a school nearby. Um, how will this impact that school? How many students do we anticipate? And does that school have capacity? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, um, there is uh, no OC append uh, there is not an OCP amendment associated with this application. Um, so the the city does share its uh, OCP information with the school district. The school district has that uh, available for their planning needs. Um, there certainly will be a number of families that that uh, move onto the site. 
Well, I was looking at the breakdown, and, and I'm happy. There's going to be lots of family-friendly units, which means kids. So uh, but when this comes back to council, could we have a, a memo prior to that that just talks about how many uh, children of school age you anticipate, and maybe just double-check with the school district to make sure that that isn't going to be problematic for them? Let me go to wait, wait, wait. Mr. Craig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Councillor Day. Uh, when the OCP was amended to allow multifamily along this stretch of River Drive, the north stretch of River Drive, that OCP amendment was referred to the school district. Mm -hmm. It is our understanding that there is more than sufficient capacity in the existing school. Uh, with respect to uh, the number of children, uh, we do estimate that there'd be approximately 50 school age children for every 250 units. So with this application involving around 180, uh, about 40. Uh, again, I'm doing the rough math in my head here. So. I won't hold you to it. <laughs> um, uh, but it is our understanding that there's more than sufficient capacity within the existing uh, Tate Elementary School. And I would point out that by the time this uh, the school board, in terms of uh, interaction with us, this site will be required to provide school site acquisition charges at a uh, building permit. We do regularly liaise with the school district, our counterparts, when those funds are transferred to them for the purpose of forecasting school enrollment and capacity. So that money could go towards an addition if they needed it, that type of thing? Uh, the money is collected specifically for site acquisition, oh. uh, but they do use that information to forecast enrollment in existing catchments. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's an exciting project. Okay. Chuck? Yes. I just want to ask a question for a clarification. Now, this application is to apply to rezone this uh, parcel of land from industrial storage, IS, to uh, low and mid rise apartment. And um, according to OCP, um, is the destination is mixed use and also residential mixed use. So, is there any conflict here that you know um, the uh, original uh, zone, zoning is uh, IS? So, now, I ask the question because I'm concerned about the loss of industrial land for our economic development. So, would this kind of um, rezoning have a significant impact on the supply of industrial land in our, in our city? Um, through the chair to Councillor Ao, um, the proposal before you today complies with the the land use designation in the Bridgeport area plan uh, and the citywide OCP. But so, what's the consequence of the rezoning? Are, uh, we, are we losing significant uh, industrial land? Through the through the chair to Councillor Ao, uh, no, we're not losing significant industrial land in this case, as uh, Mr. Craig had pointed out. There. This area was uh, done, dealt with through an OCP amendment a number of years ago to redesignate the lands under the OCP for mixed use industrial uses. Uh, I believe what you're referring to in terms of industrial lands intensification, that's to protect the existing designated lands under the OCP. So this land being designated as residential and being rezoned from industrial to residential is consistent with the council policy and plans. That, okay. la that land's not in 40% uh, of the industrial bank. Through the chair. It's outside correct. the bank. Yeah, yeah that's the clarification okay. I see. Okay. Okay. okay, good. Okay, Andy. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so, good. I got you. you. Thanks. You're on? Yeah, thank, yeah, yeah. thanks. And through the chair, uh, thank you for the report. Uh, very detailed, very thorough. Good uh, kind of analysis and intro to it as well. Thanks for that. Uh, I think it's quite a beautiful plan and quite a beautiful looking development uh, along the riverfront. And that's really transforming into something that I think is going to be really attractive for people, including families, to live in. I was really happy to see the number of units that exceed actually our requirements in terms of uh, family friendly units, both lemur and market rental and other units. So I think that's excellent and it'll make it even more attractive. So um, that area is going to be, I think, very sought after and desirable for people. So I think it's a great addition to it. The one question I just wanted you to clarify on, because you've already commented on a lot, is that the voluntary point one uh, FAR for market rental, I think it was. Um, so it's voluntary. And can you just perhaps comment on what that actually results in and maybe a little bit about how that came to be? Sure. Um, through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, um, because this is an existing in-stream application, um, it was, uh, it's not required to comply with the, 
the city's newer mandatory market mm -hmm. rental policy. However, um, under after consideration, the developer asked if he could voluntarily um, provide market rental on site. Um, this was done with a, a 0 0.1 FAR density bonus, mm -hmm. which is exclusively used for market rental units, and it uh, accommodated the addition of 13 market rental units, which will be secured by way of a market rental agreement, housing agreement registered on title. Yeah, well, that's another excellent uh, addition that exceeds our requirements, so uh, thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Laura, did you? Uh, I'm just going to make a comment. Um, just following up on that comment, I think it's a complete development. Um, when, when you get a blend uh, of uh, strata units, uh, market rental and low income um, uh, market rental, I, and we get 31 new, more, uh, as you well know, every, every unit that we can get in Richmond is only going to help the million and a half people that are coming into here the lower mainland in the next few years. So I think it's great. The co a comment I, I, I'm going to make too is, um, now that we're talking about lemur, everybody thinks lemur are all the down and outers and the poor people of this. And I think people, we've, we've got to embellish when people put lemur in. It is great housing for people. Uh, my comment uh, in certain aspects of the community that they're drug addicts, they're homeless, they're, they're this, they're that, and those are the people moving into Lemur. Well, please read your areas and look at it. They're not drug addicts. They're not, they're families. They're, uh, yeah, they're people that make between, you know, $30,000 and $75,000. You know, they're not people that make in six figures. They're making, their, their average or average Richmond, Amer or Ri Richmond, uh, uh, family, and I think we need to talk like that too when we're talking about lemur, and uh, give it a boost because uh, uh, you know we we are going to uh, in the future get some developments that are all rental, and there's lots of lemur in it, and somebody's going to say, well, that's going to be you know over there. Anyhow, that's just an editorial from the chair for now. Uh, I have no other speakers, so uh, a motion on it moved, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. And thank you to the developer. All right. Uh, the next item is annual report on the YVR aeronautical noise. Mr. Hopkins. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have nothing further to add, but happy to uh, take any, any questions. Any comments? Or how are we doing? Are we uh, in good relations with YVR? <laughs> I know they have invited us to a meeting for a while, so I wonder. <laughs> For now, uh, the relationship is good, yes. All right. Anything uh, to, from anybody? All right. Receive for information. Oh, Carol? Yeah. Sorry. You just did it last minute there. All okay. Right. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for the report. I always dig into these because we get a lot of complaints, as you know, regarding airplane noise, and that's in the nature of living in Richmond. Um, what I'm concerned about is on PLN 146, there is a map that looks like a whole bunch of red and green spaghetti. I would like to see far larger versions of those maps. And the reason being is if we go to page uh, 150, it breaks down the departures, and we know where the complaints are. It's jet departures, and 73% of the, of the departures are jets, and 13% uh, are prop departures. We have to stay on top of this. I, I know when, when the planes use the alternative runway, the crosswinds runway, it goes right over Richmond. And I know that we can't use the north runway unless the other one is at capacity. But I think we need to stay on top of it. So if I could get um, better information on, on the, um, the maps and then maybe even a breakdown of the users of the north runway because I know it's a very low number normally in comparison to the regular runway. Is there any chance of breaking that down a little bit more? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, uh, we can certainly request that information from uh, YVR staff uh, as far as um, uh, usage of the North Runway. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we can request that information. And if you like, we can also, uh, we could circulate uh, blowing up uh, versions of those maps if you like to, to see them a little bit uh, in a bit more detail. Yeah, I, I do think we need to, because I know that we're getting to the point where 
the north runway will be needed for takeoffs. It's just that it's, it's getting at that sort of that point. And so I think that we have to have really good communication with YVR because this is a really important issue. And I'm not the one who has made 900 phone calls and complaints, you know. But I have occasionally called when they've used the crosswinds runway because it goes right over our neighborhood. And it's usually an American jet that's just cutting the corner. And you can see it, you can read the lettering, and instead of going out to where they're supposed to go, to six road and turn, they cut the corner. And so I have to say the staff at YVR have been very good about getting back to me, showing me maps very much like this one, showing that exact route of that exact plane. And they are very receptive. So I think keeping those lines of communication open is really, really important. So thank you for the report, and thank you for upgrading those Maybe graphics. we should phone President Biden. <laughs> Stop those American planes from cutting. <laughs> Everybody's cutting. I know it's the American. All right, good. Anything else? Uh, I've got Andy. You're next. Uh, thanks, and through the chair. Uh, thanks for the report. It's interesting. Um, I also just want to acknowledge and thank YVR for actually paying attention to the issue because it's probably a never-ending issue for some people. And I think it's uh, important that they do, and they're very conscientious about it, and including other issues too, like sustainability and just responding to the community. I think that's good. Um, just um, on the north runway, um, not that I'm an expert on this, but I think you might have a, an issue with takeoffs and landings on the north Wind. runway. There's a legal agreement about it, and also, when planes are landing, I think, uh, you know, there's a six mile differential and when they're taking off, it's about two and a half miles. So it's about a lot of things about efficiency. It's about conserving fuel. That's good for the environment. So you don't want to necessarily be having planes doing that. It's probably more effective the way they have it set up. And um, also my understanding is the north runway is set up and designed and constructed for landing as well so the taxiways on the north runway are for instance angled at 45 degrees versus 90 degrees so that makes quicker taxiing off the runway so you can uh, have more efficient landings and that all has many um, uh, benefits including environmental but also convenience and efficiency as the airport is operated so it's a tricky thing to get into um, having planes take off and land on the same runway as if you just think about it you can probably um, see why that could be a problem um, one question I did have, though, when it comes to propeller noise, is that more to do with the seaplanes, or is that to do with turboprops taking off, or is it seaplanes down by the river? Uh, th through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, it's, it, it is both. It is primarily the seaplanes that uh, we probably see, receive more complaints on, but uh, hmm. any uh, prop airplane um, from the south terminal as well uh, can create quite a bit of noise. Well, I'll confess to being a plane watcher and I'll also confess and admit that I love listening to seaplanes taking off and watching them and I can remember growing up here and seeing them like Carol or Councillor Day has just described flying over our house too but especially the old beavers who are they're even louder but um, anyway uh, that does kind of go with the territory of the river and uh, I think it's great that the airport pays attention to it and tries to mitigate the impact on people as much as they can but they do deserve credit for that. Thanks. I just wonder how much of uh, the, the issues, are, too, are with climate change and wind. We go up and watch the planes come in when they start coming in like this, you know, um, start with landing, and same with the beaver planes going up and banking around. Um, it's complex, uh, very complex issue, uh, whether they're using or not. Anyhow, any further discussion on this? All right, a motion to receive for information. Well, thanks, John. Thank you. All of us in favor, carried. And uh, the last item on the agenda, Fred, is the, the building sign and the bylaws. Anything to add to this report? Good afternoon. Nothing. Just a quick question uh, uh, from mine, uh, this is uh, my, my issue, is in case of noise violation, call 276. Um, it, it doesn't say it's a 24-hour-7 contact. And I think we should say that. The other is a 24-7 contact. You got any problem? Phone, I assume that's dispatch. Am I correct or wrong? Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the number provided, there are two numbers provided um, on the current sign, uh, one of which is a 24-hour contact sign for the builder. Uh, the other uh, contact number is a City of Richmond 
uh, contact number. It's uh, directed to the Community Bylaws uh, Contact Center, which is uh, staffed um, during regular business hours and through the weekend. It does provide, there are provisions for a 24-hour contact. And for more details on that, if you would like, uh, we have colleagues here from Community Bylaws that could expand on that. Okay. Uh, Carol? staff staying on top of this. I remember when we brought this forward, it was because there was people that were living in an older neighborhoods and it was yep. non-stop construction, seven days a week, like 20 hours a day, and, and they were so frustrated. And I was really pleased that we were able to put this through. And I really appreciate that, that staff has followed up and make sure that we've got it right. So adding the construction activity instead of just noise activity, I think is, is the right way to go. Having said that, um, I did talk to a builder uh, last summer when we had that heat dome. And I, I don't want to play devil's advocate here, but if it was as hot as it was last summer for that short period of time, if the builder had permission from the neighbor to maybe start earlier and end earlier, because apparently some of the workers are just ready to drop, you know, is that something that we want to open that can of worms or are we better off just to leave it the way it is? Um, through the uh, chair to councillor day um, that is not something I had anticipated uh, or thought about but it is something that uh, we could certainly um, consider currently the hours of construction are to start at 7 a.m. Yeah. Um, I would have to deliberate and consider the uh, consultation requirement for specific requests for that like, I, I don't want to make a motion or anything because I don't really want to take it that far at this point, but I'm wondering if just in general conversation with the builders, if you could just ask them, like, if, if it generally is it working out good the way it is? Because I do worry about the health of the workers because when we have those heat domes, it can be, I, I don't want to be out there, and I can imagine they can't be either. So let's just leave it as a casual conversation at this point. So thank you. Anything else? All right, uh, we have, uh, what do we got uh, for amendments, noise bylaw, et cetera. Okay, Mo motion, move seconded, all those in favor, contrary, carried. Thank you very much. Okay, managers reports, do we have anything? Hello. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you through your worship uh, to members of the committee. Uh, we just wanted to give a brief update to you that BC Housing is uh, continuing to look at potential redevelopment scenarios for Rosewood Village, which is located just southeast of number two road in Blundell. Um, so they are looking at significantly redeveloping and we've just had some high level conversations to date. Uh, we do expect that they will be engaging in some initial con um, consultation with their tenants. Um, uh, before the summer and that input, any input gained through that will be used to inform an application that they plan to submit later this fall. Okay, Carol, a question? Yeah, um, can't give us the details, but um, is there some talk of potentially maybe starting at one end and creating a much higher density and then moving everybody into the units as they're built and kind of work their way towards either the south or the north? Is that something like a transitional thing they're thinking of doing? Um, through the chair to councillor day, yes, they are definitely considering how to phase it in order to um, to be able to redevelop a portion of the site to be able to move residents yeah. um, and not have to relocate um, a couple of times. But the details are still being worked out. And given that that's right beside a shopping mall, mm -hmm. can we look at much higher density? Uh, there is potential for that in our official community plan. We do have provision to consider um, additional form of density where we're looking at um, at affordable housing and uh, you know but we're currently just waiting to see how um, the exact scenario plays out in terms of um, what they're proposing uh, for all of the units in order to figure out where that lands density-wise. Maybe we should make a motion to send them a gift basket and say, good work, let's keep up the good work. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Laura? Thank you, uh, through the chair. I'm just curious, we have rental tenure zoning on that land? Uh, we currently would, yes, I believe you. Yeah. It's, it is, uh, it's currently affordable housing, um, yes, for that. So, yeah, there is control in place. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? That's it? Yes. What? That's it. There ain't no more? Well, we'll close the uh, Penticton uh, Music Festival. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor, contrary, carry.